we're back. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and those who are somewhere in between. Um, we are here live and, and loud from all the way DC to North Carolina. I'm super thrilled um, that she let me talk her into uh, having her on my podcast because I'm not going to lie, guys, I'm a little bit intimidated by tonight's guest. She is, um, you know, the queen of podcasting, the queen of media, the queen of <laughs> supporting the fuck out of communities, especially minority communities, especially the black community here in the DMV. Um, but, you know, the pandemic uh, means that she got to, you know, run away to the beach while the rest of us are here in D.C. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. But all the way from North Carolina, uh, Molly Ruland, how are you, my love? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I am wonderful. I, um, life is insane. Life is, life is an adventure at the moment. I feel like, uh, you know, things are just kind of one day at a time at the moment um but you know the world's yeah. on fire and we're here to roast marshmallows yeah no big deal yeah i mean it's like one hour at a time for me personally sometimes it's like 10 minute windows quite frankly you know yeah 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 it's, it's touch and go over here and over here in north carolina or over yeah. here and just like just in, in this like general region of my mental health basically that's mostly there yeah <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. So for those who don't know you, don't know One Love Massive, don't know what Heartcast Media is, besides telling them to pull their heads out of their butts, um, <laughs> how, how would you, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, <laughs> obviously. I'm not very funny, this is why I do music, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what, like, who are you? Who is, who is the magic that is Molly Roland? Ooh, I'm trying to find us on Facebook. Oh my God, there it is, I just messed it up. We always, okay. tell, we always tell people to turn their volume down so that this doesn't happen. It's true. That's it's true. Okay. <laughs> I am. It's, I'm so terrible. All right. I'm starting. I'm sharing this. So okay. That people know. Um, so yeah. Who am I? I don't know, man. Who am I? That's a question I ask myself every morning when I get up. I look in the mirror and I'm like, who are you today, <laughs> man? Uh, what are you going to do with all this? For real. I know you think I'm kidding, but I'm really not um because life is weird right now hold on why why is it so hard oh here we go okay i shared now <laughs> I, I cannot do more than one thing at a time apparently um that's okay that's okay who am apparently i apparently it's impossible to do more than one thing at a time it is apparently it's multitasking is an absolute fallacy it's bullshit yes i have mm -hmm. read a couple books that were talking about that and they said that exactly and i feel like i just proved that <laughs> Case in point, case study, we can close that chapter. The jury has spoken, but- um, oh, I love it. Uh, who am I? I don't know. I'm just a kid who grew up in Falls Church, Virginia, and a old lady who spent a whole lot of years in Washington, DC. And uh, I love the people that loved me back, you know? Um, a lot of my adult years were spent heavily influenced by two people in my life uh, who like helped me you know, learn what I was capable of and taught me about fasting and, you know, raw food cleanses and mental health. And they were all, you know, members of the black community. And so that's just, you mm -hmm. know, I don't know when you, when you spend a lot of time in DC, like you're the minority, right. And it's not, it's not even like black and white. It's like, I have friends from every continent, you know what I mean? I have mm -hmm. friends from, like, it's, you know, from New Zealand, we, what from New Zealand even, I mean, for real. So yeah, man. So I'm just a product of my environment. I, I, I love DC. My cousin played for the bullets. Little fun fact. Most people don't know Jeff mm -hmm. Ruland, uh, right. Little association there. Um, I love it. he was one of the beef brothers. Like back in the day, I go to Seven Eleven and they'd have like a life-size poster of my cousin in the store. Oh, I'd be that's kind of like, awkward. That's my cousin. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm just a regular person, man. I'm a, I'm an artist. I'm 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 outspoken. I'm just a regular person. Doing epic things. I mean, I just don't have an option of like it's either just keep going or lay down and die. And like I tried laying down <laughs> and die and it doesn't work that way. You just lay on the ground for a while and then you're like, I'm fucking hungry, man. Like <laughs> you know, like it's really hard to will yourself to death. I don't know if you've ever tried, but like it's really hard. So 
um yeah man i don't know like you know when you don't really have a plan b right like i i, I grew up with like you know a very supportive but raised me to be super independent family and moved out at 17 mm -hmm. and then never really went back home and so i had to be resilient because mm -hmm. there wasn't like an option for anything else um mm -hmm. and having a few spinal surgeries definitely shaped you know how i see life and what matters and what doesn't and what i want to be a part of and what i don't want to be a part of and so i'm very very clear on that part so i don't know if i'm doing epic things or i'm just really consistent in my path because i know ex i already did what things mortgage business i did a bunch i've done a lot i've been a business manager for toyota i'm certified to be mm -hmm. a preschool teacher i've been a living nanny I've been a hotel analyst. I traveled all over the Caribbean. I had like fake IDs. It's a whole, whole we'll talk about that later. Um, yeah, man, I've done a lot, you know, real estate finance for 13 years, probably already said that, but like, I've done a lot, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of times it was recovering from a surgery and having to reinvent myself or find a way to make money that wasn't conventional because like I couldn't leave my house because I was in so much pain. So like, I just made my life work knowing that there wasn't like a, there wasn't an, an out. And then, you know, after having so many spinal surgeries, you just realize like what matters and what doesn't. And I don't want to make unscrupulous motherfuckers money anymore. And so mm -hmm. I put all my love and energy into One Love Massive and bringing people together through art, music and culture, uh, because I'm a very impassioned person who like, uh, my, my mom used to call me the queen of the Justice League. I don't want to brag or anything, but, um, <laughs> And I still feel that way. Like, that's just who I am. That's always been who I am. I was like delegating yeah. on the playground, probably. You know what I mean? It's just built in me. I don't like to see people hurting. I can't, I, can't, I just don't, you know what I mean? I'm not built that way. And so mm -hmm. um, when you think you're going to die a bunch of different times, as you know, yeah. You know, as I know, yeah. It pu puts shit in perspective. So, you know, you, you don't feel like you're fearless or a badass. You're just living your truth, but you're a fearless badass. I mean, I, mean I, I think you're, <laughs> I think, I think you're right though. Like when you're, when you come near death, it's really hard to not be like, okay, get the fuck over yourself. It's just a bad day. Get up, keep fighting, you know? Um, and it's funny that you've, I mean, it's funny. That's a, that's a weird choice of words. <laughs> it's, it's uh, fascinating, endearing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that you've had so much spinal surgery because you know obviously with my health condition um having cerebral spinal fluid the, the crux of my condition of hydrocephalus um you know you and I have similar mm -hmm. uh struggles when it comes to the health um you know struggling with with health conditions and things yeah. um how like how many surgeries have you had in total can I ask three three yeah okay I'm, nice. I'm slightly jealous. <laughs> I know, right? Like, that's nothing compared. It was 1931 and 34. Okay. So, I'm so last year. Sure. Yeah. You got that right. <laughs> Just, so, or, you know, late last year, really, actually. I mean, clearly, clearly, clearly. Yeah. So, <laughs> when it comes to time, I, I... It's okay. Uh, it's, it's a thing today is just this week has been a shit show this the last five months have just been a shit show i know right so, <laughs> i'm like let's but, be honest the last 44 years for me have been a shit show. I'm just but, okay so when it comes to being in a shit show sort of situation um you know i've watched in like i i've known you known of you for years through your work with One Love Massive. I've known you personally because I think I bribed you with maybe like hugs or something ridiculous. <laughs> I'm like, I saw you at One Love Massive. I'm like, I want to be your friend. Um, that's pretty much how I get all my friends. <laughs> um, um, and, but over the last, you know, five months of this pandemic, you have totally stepped away from One Love Massive. You've given it up. You have established an entirely new business model with Hardcast Media. You have a phenomenal group of um, people, uh, you know, in your team now. You are 
have, you know, you're networking with people all over the world via Twitter and you're establishing a, a free education pl platform to empower communities even more through podcasting, through education, through art, through information technology, through just sharing and empowering humans with knowledge. Um, and you're doing it despite the fact that you know, we're also going through a human rights crisis and surprisingly, you're a white woman advocating for minority communities, predominantly the black community. And so you're dealing with a whole bunch of shit in that sort of realm. How the fuck are you coping? Well, I mean, well, so, so, so to be totally fair, um, thank you, first of all, that was a hell of an introduction. Um, <laughs> I'm like, damn, I did all that shit. That's crazy. Um, yeah, you did. <laughs> but but I have to say, I didn't do it during the pandemic. So I actually shut down One Love Massive in 2018. I just did it quietly. Um, okay. I just sort of faded back because I just didn't have anything else to give. So the, the accounts were up. It was just sort of chilling. I, I dabbled with like giving it to somebody else uh mm -hmm. just like pass you know because it was this platform it was you know and it just uh and then i just realized you know i spent 20 years building that thing i think it's just ready to kind of retire because what i realized is that um you know i mean th this is your podcast so we're just going to keep it 100 but i had a terrible year in 2018 i had a miscarriage mm -hmm. uh that messed with my health i bled for 10 months uh, which oh, meant wow. that like several times a day I was reminded of that miscarriage. So I was never a given the space to like heal from it or get over it or whatever. My cycle, everything was just totally off. And it was because I was overworked. I was cleaning four Airbnbs a day in order to pay the rent on T Street. And I was cleaning up after people all day. And then I'd go to the studio and I'd have to clean up after those people. And I just felt really unloved and really uncared for. And I was deteriorating and I was deteriorating in front of people's eyes and it didn't change the way that people treated me or ex what they expected of me, even though mm -hmm. they, they saw what was happening firsthand. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just going, going, going. And the doctors thought that I had cancer because it was bleeding for so long. And, um, wow. and they uh, did this like, you know, really just not fun series of tests. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, yo, what if I have like six months to live? And then I was relieved. And so I was like, all right, I have, to, I have to address this, you know? And it just made me realize like, yo, if I have six months to live, like I sure as shit ain't fucking cleaning four bathrooms a day anymore. You know what I mean? And then it mm -hmm. dawned on me in that moment, if I don't want to die this way, I don't want to live this way either. And I, and I, I, uh, you Sorry, know. that was straight to the feelings for me. Like, <laughs> okay, yes. I'm but here I mean, it. why does it take, um, you know what I mean? And I feel like after so many surgeries, I've already been centered. I've already had that, like, yo, are you good? If you die tomorrow, are you good? Like, are you really good self? Like, no one else in the room for that conversation. And you know what that's like, because any surgery mm -hmm. can cost you your life. But when they're operating on your spine or your brain, those numbers mm -hmm. go up significantly. And so you have to ask yourself those questions. Like, are you fucking good with yourself, man? You know? Mm -hmm. And having those conversations like really leveled me, but this was just different. You know what I mean? And I just, I uh, reverse Oprah my life. I was like, you gotta go and you gotta go and you gotta move <laughs> out. And I ain't dating you no more. Like it was, you know, like it was just a rat. I couldn't do it anymore. You know what I mean? I had nothing left to give, right? Yeah. There's so many cliches pouring from an empty vessel. Like we could go on and on, but like I was yeah. deteriorating in front of people's eyes and I just, you know, I bit off more than I could chew with that building. No regrets. Like, I don't regret anything I ever did with One Love. I had a beautiful, wonderful life filled with amazing people like you and Nick. I mean, come on, man. Like, mm. you know, so many amazing. I mean, I, if I even started to list all the people like that I've worked with, you know, through DC Music and that I love, this podcast would go on for four hours, right? I'd be like, I need another drink. Hold on. We're, we're on to letter N, you know? And so... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't regret any of it, but it was just more than I could chew and it was more than I could do. And like, it's just really hard to not make money, but have a sustainable business in local music. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I, feel I don't you. know how to do it. Honestly, I don't think it exists. And I'm sure there's tons of people smarter than me who might figure it out. But I tried for 20 years. 
and I couldn't figure it out. If you want to make things equitable and affordable and do free parties, like where's the money? Who's paying the band? Who's paying the deposit? Who's paying security? Who's paying the dormant? Like there's so much money that go who's paying for the flyers? Who's doing all the prep work? Who's doing the social media? But like, there's so much work that goes into it. And if there's no money, there's no money. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people have these misconceptions like, oh, you're doing a party here. It was free, dude. What? You see any bottles with sparklers in this motherfucker? No, man. Like, <laughs> there's no money here, man. This is an indie. You know what I mean? Like, there's, you know, but, you know, there's people that have experience and have done things. And then there's people who just think life is super black and white. And they just don't, they just lack the perspective and experience to understand that, like, everything costs money, right? Mm -hmm. And if you, if your business isn't sustainable, it can never be successful. And One Love Massive was not sustainable and, uh, and therefore it would never be successful. And I just, you know, like Willie Nelson said, you know, when to hold them and when to fold them. And I no went to walk them. away. And no one <laughs> walked away. And I walked away. No went to know? run. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. and it felt good. I was okay with it. I didn't feel defeated. I didn't feel like my ego was bruised because it was something I worked for so long. I was totally okay with it. Like, like I said, my face lights up when I think about all the things that we did. Like, I mean, we did amazing shit. I got to ride bikes and do graffiti. And I mean, come on, man. Life was, life was lit for a long time until it wasn't. And then it's just time yeah. to make a change, you know? So two questions then. Like if you could go back to your like, five year younger self in the midst of all that is there anything that you would change the only thing that i would change is i would uh acquire a board of directors for myself because the thing as an entrepreneur or an artist you can go mm -hmm. sign any contract or any lease and there's nobody there to stop you if you have a nonprofit, you have to, you have a board of directors and they can't be family members and they can't be your husband or your wife. There's all these like rules to make sure that like shit doesn't get fucked up. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But with, with an entrepreneur situation or an independent artist, there's nobody there to be like, don't sign that shit. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. if not, you got to pay somebody to advise you or you can't really trust your friends because they might not know and they might advise you in the wrong way. Right. Like well-intended, but like, and so, yeah, if I had maybe like shown some people who are smarter than me, like the lease that I signed on T Street, they would have been like, don't sign it. But also, if I'm being honest, I purposely didn't show anybody because I wanted it. Right. I didn't want anybody to find holes in it. And, and it didn't have to be so hard. You know what I mean? So now I surround myself with people that I can like ask questions to and I can lean on and say like, is this a good idea? Is this a bad contract? Or do you have any experience with this? Or do you know somebody I can talk to about that? And that just makes a huge difference is like, yeah, man, get you a little village, a little, you know, board of directors to help you make decisions. Cause you don't yeah, have to real. figure everything out on your own. For real, for real. So going from, from One Love Massive to Heartcast Media, what was that change like for you? Um, well, I just, you know, I was the, you know, the, the brainchild behind you know, the factory floor sessions and the back to the go-go and like figuring out like how we could use that space and how we like what, you know, what to do and then how to do it. And then, you know, that was all me. Right. And I really figured out this great IP. I mean, don't get me wrong, Nick and Mike helped me execute, but it was like, you know, I was the brainchild behind that. And so I realized that I had this great IP where I could produce content with very little post-production. And I knew that that <laughs> would be viable in the business world. <clears throat> because all businesses need audio and video content. Mm -hmm. And there's this huge, you know, canyon between artists and creatives and creative work in the business world. People will pay like $10,000 for the shittiest like company video. That's like three minutes long that like has seven views on YouTube, like for real. That's like a all the time thing, uh, you know? And then meanwhile, you have like young filmmakers who've never even, you know, self-taught like out here filming videos that are like geniuses who can't pay their rent. You know what I mean? And I was like, there's gotta be a happy medium where I can come in and provide like a, 
affordable and sustainable solution while still making, you know, seven times. Well, I wasn't making anything doing it for one level. We lost money doing it. Now I can charge people $350 an hour for the stuff that I was doing for artists for free. Mm -hmm. And at, you know, being 44, like, I just don't, I don't want to be at the bar until 3 a.m. I don't want to be at the party anymore. I don't want to be on the parking lot for 17 hours, two days in a row. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like, I just, I loved it when I did it, but I don't want to do it anymore, man. Back hurts. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't even want to drink whiskey so anymore. I want to drink a glass of wine and go to bed. You know, <laughs> for real. I think, I think I might be 44. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, that sounds lovely. But for real, before I'd be like, let's do three shots of Jameson and then go spray paint some shit. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> now I'm like, I'm going to snuggle up with a book, you know? I mean, there's nothing wrong with reading, but just saying. <laughs> just saying. Cheers <laughs> to all my readers out there. <laughs> so, uh, but also, but uh, for anybody who's watching this who isn't from DC or familiar with DC culture, um, T Street was the original location of the One Love Massive building. Um, it was right above Grindstone, I think is the name of the, the label. Um, and GoGo, if you don't know what GoGo -Go is, is the uh, official genre of DC music, uh, specifically, um, you know, brought to life by Chuck Brown and uh, his, his band back in, back in the day, but also uh, it's a very percussive uh, genre that you need to go and Google now well after this podcast um so you Brown. can familiarize yourself yeah with with that genre um okay so you're now doing heartcast media you're now you know basically respecting your value um and being respected for your for your value how i mean you i've, I've been seeing on the on the headlines and you're you're for ever on Twitter and doing all these amazing connections and networking on Twitter, you recently um, held an IG live because you are also the queen of Instagram. Let's be real. No, I'm um, not. That's a straight you up totally line. are. No, you not. totally are. I'm like I. I see all of your all of your lives. I'm like I need to do better. Molly is like on my shoulder, going, "Do better, Emma. You're oh. sucking at this." No, I would never. <laughs> you can do even it. even a miniature me would never say that. Unless I was really drunk, but no, I would never say that. <laughs> but okay, but you you recently had an IG live and uh, sort of launching uh, the educational platform with Heartcast Media, and you had met a phenomenally uh, wealthy human being. I I can't remember his name for the life of me Gary on v. Twitter. You're Gary so V. I am very funny. I'm. This is why I do. Uh, I'm not very funny at all. But thank you for the no, for you're the great. Blatant. <laughs> you're amazing. So I'm Stop lying. But you managed to like get people like Gary V to come up and support what you're doing now. Do you feel that is based, like, is that a manifestation thing? Is that a Molly Ruland thing? Is that a Heartcast Media thing? Is that a, is that a? It's an unapologetically myself all the time and wish I had a little bit more filter. So let me tell you the Gary V story. Gary V has like, 9 million followers on Twitter and Instagram. The dude is like a legit marketer. He has a company called Vayner Media. Um, he's just like, if you do marketing, like, you know who Gary Vee is, right? Like, he gets like 80 grand to do like keynote speeches, right? Like, the dude flies around the world, you know, and he's great. He's like, fuck college. It's a joke. And like, fuck you, Chad. Like, I fucking, I love him. Like, I just, I mean, he's like, has a lot of gems too, but he takes no shit. And he's kind of an asshole, but like, that's what I love about him, honestly, you know? Um, and I was on Twitter and I saw this meme that said that like Vayner Media or that Gary V donates to Trump. Mm -hmm. And so I went to his Twitter profile and he had the blackout box. And so it's funny because you say you, you network with people on Twitter. What actually happened is I saw it and I tweeted him and I said, get the fuck out of here with all that fake ass support. That was my opening line, not my <laughs> finest moment. I'm just saying that's exactly how it went down. And he responded. And he was like, hey, man, you know, like, 
we don't donate to Trump like Stephen Ross, who's like a huge billionaire guy who donates in a lot of companies and he donates a bunch of money to Trump. But then he donates the equal amount of money to the Democrats. Like he's definitely playing a game. The guy's in a bunch of people's pockets. He invested in VaynerMedia in 2011 and Stephen Ross donates to Trump. So it was just like, you know, not, you know, it's like, you know, the internet likes to spin shit. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's what it was. It was like, no, it's not Gary V donating and it's not even VaynerMedia, it's Stephen Ross, right? But it was still like, yeah, but I was like, Gary, but you've made enough money now. You could buy him out. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I was like, not all money is good money, man. Like, we all make decisions when we take money. I mean, we were like kind of sparring back and forth. And then he, I was like, hey, man, if there's anything I could ever do. And he like filmed a video and he was like, hey, bro, I can tell you're upset. And I was like, I'm not a bro. I'm like, they only call me that on the drive through and on the phone sometimes. But uh, and he was like, you know, if there's anything I can ever do, because I mean, he held his own, but he was basically like, listen, man, if you follow the money anywhere, it ends up and like, he's like, we, we'd have to divest from like gas stations and banks. And like, mm -hmm. he's like, it, you know, and I'm like, yeah, you're right. And that just makes me more sad, you know, mm -hmm. honestly. Uh, mm -hmm. but he was like, Hey, I can tell you really care if there's anything I can ever do. And I was like, word, well, I just launched this content for change creator Academy where I'm going to empower people and teach them how to elevate and amplify content that gets seen and heard so we can replace the narrative instead of changing it, you know? And so that's what I'm doing. And he goes, that's amazing. I love that. I love you. And if you want to go live on my Instagram to give it some juice, I'm happy to do that. And I was like, you'll really do that. And he was like, yeah. And then he did. Um, so I think the lesson there is be yourself, right? Like, don't try to be something that you're not because like, had I not told Gary V, like get the fuck out of here with all that fake ass support, we wouldn't have gotten that $12,000 donation to a program that's actually gonna empower a whole bunch of kids on how to create content and replace the fucking narrative. Yeah, I love it, I love it. So back to my more formal questions. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um. My, I guess my first question is like how beyond moving like you sold up everything and you moved states um down south I think is North Carolina yeah. south from here yeah um I'm like trying to learn my geography here my bad um how how has this pandemic affected both Molly Rowland but also Heartcast Media well um you know, for me, I had an Airbnb in my basement that paid a lot of my rent. So when the pandemic hit and that dried up overnight, the writing was on the wall. So I cut my lease and cut my losses before I got into any more debt with my landlord. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, the studio where Hardcast was, um, they were not trying to clean the building anymore and they weren't trying to offer a discount. They weren't trying to make any accommodations at all. And they were just insisting that I still bring my clients in, even though the mayor had shut down the city um and they weren't cleaning and uh my lease just happened to be up uh may 1st anyway and i was like listen it's either your rent or my staff and she was like well you have a lease and i was like oh word so uh i closed the lease i paid for may even though i wasn't there april um because you know sometimes people like to kick you when you're down and there's a pandemic going on uh and uh -huh. they work at the hyrick house uh but um you know, I just took the opportunity to get out. I figured it's going to be a minute before people are going to want to go back in the studio. And so there's no point in me paying rent. And it was like the best call. It sucked because I did like it there up until that very moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just, you know, the writing was on the wall. So I got got out and I, you know, came down here for a visit and decided to stay. And um, I flipped my business to remote. So the first month, it was like really slow. I was like, I don't know, man. You know, I don't know. I think everybody was just... I don't know, right? Like the whole world. Uh, and then things started to pick back up again. And now business is booming. B business is like doubled. My expenses are about $7,000 a month less by not having those leases. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm living in a very peaceful, beautiful place. I mean, I'm lonely. I'm by myself. I'm still quarantined. I'm chilling in this apartment working all the time. So it's not like I'm out here like on boat rides and shit. But um, it's not like a Coors Light commercial in this piece. You know what <laughs> I mean? So um but yeah, you know, I'm just like, uh, you know, sticking to myself. It's tough, man. It's hard to spend so much time alone. I had, I, you know, I surrounded myself with people for the last 20 years. And mm. now I spend so much time alone. And it's definitely taking its toll on me. I mean, I'd be lying to you if I said otherwise. Mm -hmm. you mm. know. How are you managing to stay sane then? 
Um, reading, meditating, and exercising. <laughs> That's it. Secret to life, guys. You heard it here first. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, and therapy. I got one of those like talk space, you know, online therapists, so I can be like, ah. And like oh. text when I need to. And that's been really helpful because I find that like traditional therapy is tough because it's like Wednesday at two. And it's like, well, what if I'm in a good mood and I don't want to talk about all my family shit? You know what I mean? Like right, right, right. I could really mess up a day. You know what I mean? If you're not, if you're not in that space, it's hard to put yourself into it. You know, um, like I was raised Catholic and we would have to go confess. And sometimes I'd be like, I don't, I don't even have any sins. So I would lie to the priest about having committed sins. So I would have something to say in confession, you know, Catholicism, you know, <laughs> intrinsically flawed. Um, but yeah, man, that's a real story. I'd be like, I kicked my sister once. Like, I don't know. Um, but like, you know, yeah, man, therapy is tough. So I find it really helpful to just like have somebody on demand. And so like, even if she can't respond right away, I can just unload and be like, I'm super sad today or I'm feeling really panicky or whatever it is. And then she'll respond. And it's just about like being seen and heard and then having mm -hmm. a place to put that. Um, and I've also just really, uh, I put this app blocker on my phone. And so I cannot get on any social media platform before 10 a.m. or after 8 p.m. That's awesome. Game changer. Game I changer. need to invest in this. Okay, yeah, it's, I it's love free. it. It's literally called, hold on. I'm pretty sure it's literally called app blocker. Okay. App, it's called app block. And what's great about this is that um, you can block the app and the website. Cause I would just block the app and then I'd look, like go to the browser and open Facebook like an idiot. You're like, I'm so glad I set this blocker from myself so I could find no. a workaround. Like, no, I hear you. I so hear ridiculous. you. I, I've recently uh, installed a, a process into my life where I do not check my social media before 12 p.m. Nice. Um, all, all of my time in the morning is spent watching, like reading The Morning Brew, which you referred me on to. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> and meditating and exercising and reading and catching up on coursework um you know doing, i'm doing a couple of courses during nice. my free time which i totally have right uh, <laughs> yeah. that yeah that, that, that's awesome um so beyond the pandemic there has been obviously you may have heard a couple of times um this political rally cry that's broken out across the world um, it started obviously in Minnesota um, with the murder of George Floyd. Um, as an artivist, as an activist, as a very, and I, I, I use the term light and brighter, um, how, how is that affecting you, your soul, your work, um, and your output? It's been very difficult because I have a little bit of survivor's guilt. I feel like I should be in DC because, you know, I would be at the heart of those protests. And like, I'm looking online, I'm like, those are my bike friends. Like, those are all, like, those are all the people I just spent the last seven years riding bikes with. Like, those are my friends I went to raves with. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like all my worlds are converging down there and I'm not there. And that feels very uncomfortable mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm also in the South. I mean, I'm in, you know, 15 minutes from Wilmington where three police officers were caught on camera saying like, we can't wait for this race war. We can't wait to go out and slaughter these N words. Like just, you know, just the most racist vile shit I've ever heard in my life. Like mm -hmm. Christ almighty. Um, and so it makes me feel super alone. It makes me feel really, really isolated because you know, there's a lot of people who feel that way down here. And I've spent the last 20 years in D.C. So it's uh, it's not like I, I'm not like, oh, what do you mean the South is racist? Like, I'm not naive. It's just still another thing to be here in the middle of all of this. Um, and there's plenty of nice people, you know, Lundy and Teresa, if you're watching, Southern Hospitality, like lovely, wonderful. I've been treated very nice by people, with, you know, just trying to interact or be on dating apps or join you know, Facebook community groups and stuff. It's like, oh, fuck, man, this is no joke down here. Like, 
uh, Confederate flags on trucks and, you know, this one guy mm -hmm. had this sticker on the back of his truck and said my family and had different size semi-automatic rifles on the back, like five of them instead of like stick figures. I was like, word, you know, word. Cause I can't tell you how many times I've been like, damn, I wish I had five semi-automatic rifles on me right now. That would be so handy. Um, so, it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, like what, you know, like, are you, are we hunting right now? Cause that's the only time I could even imagine needing one of them, but like, even yeah. still, it's just, it's a lot, it's a big culture shock. Like, you know, I kind of forgot, you know, that things are very, very different than DC. And even though mm -hmm. DC isn't chocolate city anymore, it sure as hell ain't Wilmington. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I, um, you know, as, as the, this, the states are kind of trying to reopen in a physically distant fashion. I've been doing a couple of shows over in Virginia and, uh, you know, being a brown person with a predominantly white crowd and uh, most of whom are very proud of their gun ownership um, and wear their, their t-shirts and things. It's just, it's interesting. It's, it's really interesting. <laughs> So I hear you. I hear you. And I'm no stranger to North Carolina. It's a, it's a different world. How are you, how are you managing to balance that with things like dating? Are you dating? Well, kind of? you know, that's the thing. I'm super paranoid to meet anybody new. So I'm just like talking to people on dating apps and then they only get but so far. And then that's kind of a wrap. Um, and now, you know, for the first time in my life, I have to be like, who are you going to vote for? And I've never asked that question. Never before mm -hmm. in my life have I been like, are you a Bush fan? You know, um, but I definitely got to That's a whole other conversation. But are you a <laughs> George Bush fan? Um, like, <laughs> I love you. Um, but I feel like I have to ask that. And it's just such a divisive question to start a conversation yeah. off of. But I'm like, I don't even want to invest because like feelings are really fragile right now. And like a little bit of rejection feels like a lot of rejection and like running mm -hmm. into that callousness like makes me feel even more alone. So I have to be super careful. So it's this very difficult dance of like really wanting some companionship and like wanting to be able to like talk with somebody you know, in mm. that kind of a way, but then like being afraid to meet anybody and then trying to figure out if they have like five guns in their truck or like, you know what I mean? Cause like, I, you know, I, I don't like hate Trump supporters, but I am not dating one. Like <laughs> absolutely. Like that gives me like chest pains, even just thinking about that. So, you know, it's difficult, right? It's difficult. Uh, you know, one guy, I, I was chatting with him and he said something about the pandemic and he put it in quotes. And I said, why did you, why'd you put it in quotes? And he said, well, because it's not real. And I said, well, I know like lots of people who have lost lots of family members and like multiples of people. And he said, the first thing he said to me was, did they have a pre-existing condition? I'm like, that's your knee-jerk response when I'm like, you know, and wow. so okay. it just makes it hard, right? Because it's like, I want to meet somebody, but I don't want to deal with that. And I feel like everybody's going through that right now, right? Like, you know, and then I don't want people are like, well, just let's meet. And I'm like, bro, there's a pandemic. Like, I'm like, we need mm -hmm. to talk on the phone like three times. Before. I'm not risking my life just to find out you're a chode. <laughs> <laughs> like, Sorry, I haven't heard the term since middle school. <laughs> I love it. It's my favorite. It's like, ugh. Um, Cause it just summer you're like oh yeah i know what a chode is but um but you can figure that out on a, on a phone yeah. call you know what i mean a couple yeah. phone calls in you can talk about enough to know like if it's gonna i don't need to literally risk my life to go figure out that like we're not gonna get along at all right like right um and so i don't know if other people are still just like let's meet for coffee i'm like where at the fucking hospital like what, what do you mean <laughs> meet for coffee um yeah no that's it's it's real and i i feel like uh you know that the number of of cars and human beings who feel it necessary to you know randomly pull over on the side of the street and ask you out for coffee I'm like yo they're, they're where's your mask 
first of all. Second of all, I don't know you. Drive the fuck on. We're in a pandemic. Um, yeah. Anyways, um, speaking, you, you mentioned uh, about um, your previous life as, as a rave a holic here <laughs> in the DC. Um, I want to I want to uh, touch base if if, if I can um, on Sam the Man Burns, who was a close yeah. friend of yours. Yeah. Um, now I'm obviously not from here, surprisingly. I'm from <laughs> New Zealand. I know, shocking. Um, but he touched the lives of many many people in the DC scene. Um, can you tell me a bit more about like the rave culture here? I mean, Basically how Sam participated. Yeah, well, the rave culture was huge here. So, you know, I mean, absolutely huge. Uh, you know, Capitol Ballroom, you know, The Edge. These were all places where um, where the baseball stadium is right now in D.C. Right. And so there were these like shady clubs that were like the size of football fields that just like you know, it was like Baltimore or DC is where you went to rave. And I mean, it was just a real underground spirit. It was like, you know, the, the mid nineties, you know, um, people mm. wore like big jeans and like, you know, people had like an ebook where you would like go to a rave and be like, will you sign my book? And like, you know what I mean? Like it was just like a real, like cell phones didn't exist then. So people weren't like, you know, like it was just a very innocent, fun time. And I think it, I think a lot of people really discovered themselves and who they were because of like raves and, you know, cause of ecstasy too, but not all right. You know, like, mm -hmm. um, and it's crazy because it was such an influential part of the DC scene that so many people in the industry right now, like we were mm -hmm. all at the same parties back in the day. I can't tell you how many people in this city, like manage this nightclub and our GM of this spot and our booking agent here. And it was like, dude, we were all at those same raves together. And some of us knew each other mm -hmm. then a lot of us didn't, you know, there's different groups, but like we were all, you know, Paul Oakenfold at nation. Like, you know what I mean? Like we were, you know, we were there, like there's common mm -hmm. things in this like sense of community that we felt that a lot of us carried with us and everything that we did, which was like a big, you know, part of one love massive and so much of the, you know, underground scene in DC that exists right now. Mm. Mm. Well, once it reopens. <laughs> oh man. Crazy. Yeah. And Sam was just like, you know, Sam, so Sam was an OG, you know, and like Sam, you know, played red and, and club five. And like, Sam was just like, you know, I remember one time I was talking to Sam about Mark Barnes and Mark Barnes is a black promoter in DC that ran, um, dream and love nightclub. And, um, uh, what is it? Josephine's Josephine's. Oh my God. I can't believe I'm forgetting, but anyway, legendary nightclub owner, um, you know, unscrupulous to some, not to others, right? It's questionable, you know, whatever. But the dude did a lot for like DC music. And I remember one time I was like, yeah, fuck that guy. And Sam was like, well, hold on, you know? And uh, Sam was always, always had a great way of being like, you know, let me just, you know, in a non judgy way, just like break it down. And he was saying like, you know, DC wasn't, even though it was Chocolate City, it wasn't like, you know, like him and all his friends would go out and, and they wouldn't be able to get in because they were black. And Sam, Sam is black, but he was very light skinned. And so he would get to go in a lot and he was you know telling me that like mark barnes changed that and mark barnes created like an, a creative economy and like opened the doors for like black entertainment in dc in a lot of ways huh. um yeah and so like sam just always had a really great way of like just letting you know the real deal and giving you you know a, a, a fair shake at somebody you know what i mean it, it made me change the way that I looked at Mark Barnes and he was still flawed. He still messed some stuff up, but it's like, yeah, man, people aren't the sum of their mistakes. You know what I mean? And I think Sam did that for a lot of people. And I think Sam brought a lot of people together on the dance floor and off. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, man, he'll be sorely missed. I mean, he used to spend every Sunday night at 18th Street Lounge. And, and I mean, that's the one place in DC where there was dance circles and baby powder on the dance floor. And like people came to get down, like, you know, like the only thing that mattered is if you were wearing the right shoes to do the moves you wanted. You know what I'm saying? Like it was not a fashion show. It was not a, you know what I mean? A typical DC and DC definitely have devolved into this like bullshit poshy, you know, 
twelve dollar mojitos and marble yeah. bar scene like way too early, and we lost all of our nightclubs. We lost nation. We yeah. and that's when all these underground groups started to form and do stuff like, you know, like Ten Tigers and like Buster and stuff. I mean, this is years later, but like in their back room, they had like an amazing sound system. And like at eleven o'clock on a Friday night, it was like the best DJs in the city would play. But like during the day, it's a restaurant. Like so, a lot of that happened in DC, and like a lot of people stepped up to the plate and Sam was very good about like playing those parties. If you asked him to like Sam, like upheld, you know, the truth in DC for a very, very long time. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. And I'm, I'm sorry to, you know, sorry that I didn't get, get to meet him or hear his music, but you know, he definitely has left an impact on the culture. That's for sure. Um, so how are you, um, you know, like, how are you managing to navigate? Um, I, I guess I've already asked you this, but like, is there anything that you're doing differently now than you might have done if you were living in DC, given, the, especially given the uh, political kind of uh, friction that's happening? specifically in North Carolina? Well, I mean, what I'm doing down here is like trying to, you know, get involved and like produce better content. So like I did a fundraiser, excuse me, an online fundraiser for the YWCA and their like tagline is empowering women and fighting racism. Um, I'm hoping to be working with um, another really large organization to create some like voter registration videos. Like I'm doing my part that way with like larger reaching messaging, um, mm -hmm. doing some stuff with the Department of Health about public safety and public health and stuff like that. So that's how I'm, you know, trying to give back. It's like smarter, not harder, um, mm -hmm. you know, and just be, being the best that I can. I think right now, the best thing that I can do is like make sure that I can continue to pay my staff. I feel like the, the greatest duty I have as an American right now is two things. Number one, vote. And number two, not fire anybody, you know? Yeah, for real. Um, and provide stability and, and income for the people that, you know, are helping me get this thing across the finish line. So, or, you know, to the next baton pass, there's, there's no finish line. That's a lie. But, um, but yeah, man, yeah. you know, I think that's just like the, you know, and I'm trying to protect my health and I'm trying to be like the, you know, a light, a lighthouse in somebody else's storm when I can. And, um, protecting my mental health. I feel like the best thing that we can all do right now is protect our mental health and then have difficult conversations one-on-one -on -one and not do it on Facebook. Keep a warrior life is a thing. It's, it's very unhelpful. Yeah, I totally agree. Cause the <laughs> problem is like, like Russian bots are like fucking infiltrating all of our shit. And so like those people mm. that like I argue with online are probably Russian bots. And now all I'm doing is giving that visibility like I'm actually, yeah. I'm fueling this operation, you know, like I was talking yeah. to somebody who like works for the state department and she was like, Molly, like, you know, or was it her? It was somebody else, but like, no, it was her. And she was just saying that like, you know, for years we've gone to like vulnerable countries and done the same shit. We've like created false narratives. We've created false movements. We've like destabilized governments and econ economies and communities. And we've been doing this for 20, 30 fucking years, man. Like the, we have a clear record of the United States just fucking everything up for a lot of people and, and the rest of the world figured out what we did to them and they're doing it back to us. Mm. And it's mm. all very intentional to create this divide and create this anger. And then the more we comment on that, the more Facebook shows it, cause that's how the algorithms work. So now it seems like more people feel that way. And sometimes you feel like you're in this stadium full of people who all feel this one way and then you're in the middle of the field being like but this isn't right and these are real people and i don't understand but they're not real there's not mm -hmm. as many as them as we think and they might not even be real people at all mm -hmm. you know so mm -hmm. you know and it's hard it's, it's super easy to get caught up in that but i think that honestly the best thing we can do is not have those conversations i mean if you're having productive conversations and you have a circle like that on facebook that you can do that sure but like, if it's not, then like, we're helping the enemy tear this country apart, man. Mm -hmm. What do you suggest is the best way to counter attack 
when it comes to those conversations beyond just keeping on strip scrolling is, I mean, is there anything that we can do to like that- help Asking a lot of questions and not being insulting, which is really hard. Sometimes I want to be like, you fucking idiot. I mean, like, like all the time, actually. But I mean, sometimes I'm just like, fuck, man. But that's not it, right? You know what I mean? And like, I don't know. I spent, <clears throat> this is really interesting. So I spent like a week at a girlfriend of mine's house or, or parents' house because they live a couple hours from here. And she was like, oh, my parents are in North Carolina. I was like, oh, yeah, do they want a roommate for a week? Because, like, I have a gap in housing. And she was like, I'll ask. And I was like, I was kind of kidding, but, like, I, I'm, they're cool. <laughs> so when I, And so they were gracious enough to welcome me into their house. And when I got there, I realized that, like, you know, they're Trump supporters. And I was like, oh, boy, you know. Um, but, like, you know, super nice people, right? It's not like they greeted me at the door with, like, pitchforks and, like, you know what I mean? Um, you know, normal, <laughs> nice people. And I was really grateful to be there. And we just started having conversations and it was just like, we were able to have like really pleasant conversations because we were, you know what I mean? Like, and like, I taught her about the 13th amendment, which she didn't even know about. Like, you know, we, but like, dude, when you're in a bubble, you know what I mean? You're in your own Uh, bubble. Right. And it's not had Netflix. (laughs) Well now, now, but like, dude, do you have any idea how many Americans up until like, three months ago did not know about the 13th amendment like this is this is i've been saying this for years people are unaware of privatized Uh, prisons and this prison labor union and complete most people are i mean think about all the posts that have been happening since like the protests where people are like i just learned about like all kinds of white people are like (laughs) what do you mean i mean it's embarrassing but they why do black lives like, matter they're like wait a minute this is terrible and we're like yeah no fucking shit man we've been saying this for a fucking while um but whatever if, if they're showing up just put them bench them until they get trained and then we'll put them on the court you know what i mean like just mm-hmm. just let them in um but yeah we had really great conversations and we were just able to share perspective and i was able to ask questions as to why and she was too and we made so much progress and it was really pleasant really nice and i'm really grateful for that opportunity and we just need to do more of that. And I find that asking questions is a really great way to do that. Um, Brene Brown has this great quote, and she says, listen with the same passion in which you want to be heard. She's great. She's great. She's so good. And that's a tough one, because I don't listen in the same passion in which I demand to be fucking heard. <laughs> so I have a lot of growing to do for sure. Um, and I think that asking questions disarms people like there's this Ted talk of this girl who or this woman who was raised in the Westboro Baptist Church. Mm-hmm. And I mean, literally raised in it was on the picket lines at like five years old, the whole bit and like people, you know, everybody hated her the whole but but she grew up in it. She her elders or, pro- you know, this is what she grew up. She didn't know. And so as mm-hmm. she got older, she had a Twitter account. And of course, people were just like, oh, you're the devil, whatever, all this terrible shit. But one Mm -hmm. person kept engaging with her and being like, well, you know, when you reference this line of the Bible, like, you know, what does that mean to you? You know, just really asking questions and and sort of exploring things with her. And it was because of her questions. And she would go read the Bible and then kind of come back to him and be like, wait a minute. Like, it was because he asked her questions that she asked questions of her own faith and self and started to realize what she had just been raised in and how bad it was. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And she like left the Westboro Baptist Church and like all these rabbis and people who she had protested against, like welcomed her into their homes. Wow. And had this huge transformation, right? And it was because that one guy, instead of being like, you're fucking terrible. He was like, okay, but you know, so which, which, which verses is like, I want to read it too. Right. You know, that's a, that's a, that takes a very patient human being. Very because you know, one conversation at a time is kind of slow going, <laughs> but you know, but what? powerful. Don't get me wrong, like it's it's worthwhile for that person, absolutely. And you hope that then they go off and tell their seven friends and so on and so on. But well, sorry, and even if it just saying. gives a little bit of humanity, right? Like my, my friend's mom who didn't know about the third because she was like, you know, but if you try hard enough, and I'm like, well, not really, like privatized prisons, like school to prison pipeline. And she was like, what do you mean? I told her, and she was like, wait, I had. Now she's now it's not just like, oh, this group of people isn't trying hard enough. She understands now that there's another layer to that. Right. And that's right. just how you start. Like, you're not going to like win any arguments. You're just like the the, the goal would be to just create a, a crack in the foundation that they go back to their house with and sit on. Right. 
you mm. know, because mm. if you're like, you know, if you're doing this, like, you're not going to convince me of anything, but you yeah. say the right thing. That's I'm going to, I'm going to sit on that. I'm going to go home with that. And I'm gonna be like, fuck man. Yeah. You know, listen with Molly Roland. I love it. I love I mean, it. That's great. <laughs> Well, it's definitely more effective than being like you heartless, racist, you know, horrible person right. on the internet who's probably a Russian troll. <laughs> I'm just saying. I am curious to know beyond surgery and realizing how vulnerable we are as human beings, what is your why? <laughs> I got nothing else to do. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I want to be good with who I am. When I'm laying on my deathbed, I want to be good with who I am. And like, I'm a principle over circumstance kind of person. So I'm I'm this way all the time, even when it's really inconvenient. Mm -hmm. You know. Um. And yeah, I mean, you can't. You know. You are what you do every day. Like you are the. You are how you behave and how you treat other people. And I just genuinely love people, even though I hate people, but I love people. Um, <laughs> you know, and I love music. I love like, you know, when I hear beautiful music, I cry. I just sob. Like, yeah. I don't take me to the symphony. They'll be like, is she okay? <laughs> I'm like, I don't even know what they're saying. <laughs> You're so beautiful. But like, <laughs> You know what I mean? We are who we are, yeah. right? And like, I just want to be a part of the good stuff, right? And it's just, I don't know. I don't know. It'd be a lot easier if I wasn't who I is, <laughs> who I am. We are who we are. I am who I am. I am. It would be a lot easier if I wasn't who I am. Anyway, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. But I don't know. What else are you going to do? I mean, for real, what else am I going to do? What am I going to do? Go, go to get a job at a nine to five? That's that's not real. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I tried that once. Oh, no. it didn't work out well. No, no. <laughs> um, is there anything that you have really learned about yourself during this pandemic and human rights crisis? Um, that I definitely need people in my life, and that uh, I'm way more sensitive and you know, tender hearted than I realized, you know, being in the music business and being mm. in the music business in DC and being the only woman in the room a lot. You know, I really hardened myself over the years in ways that I didn't realize until I didn't have to be that hard anymore. And I'm like, Oh, my bad. <laughs> yeah. You know? Sure. Um, and so now I think it's like, I'm kind of shedding a lot of that armadillo skin you know and turns out i'm not such a gangster after all i'm just a fucking sobbing crying you know tender I mean, hey. person i mean what i mean even... i always knew, but okay. <laughs> i was gonna say like you know even even gangsters if, if a toddler hands a hand you know hands a gangster right. a toy phone yes they'll pick it up so right. you know you can still be gangster molly it's okay right. i mean i don't want to be a gangster i'm not a gangster I'm like we put a little disclosure on this like i am not a gang mom i'm not a gangster if you're watching this. <laughs> but yeah man i mean yeah i think i just can't wait to hug everybody again okay. for real yeah. Um, and if there's one thing that I've really realized about myself in this pandemic is I do not want to be a part of the problem anymore. I want to be, live a sustainable life and I want to grow my own food and I want to build a house with solar energy. And I, I, I want to, I want to get out. I'm headed to Costa Rica as soon as possible. Um, and I just don't want to be, I don't want to go there to create a business. I'm not going to take advantage of anybody. I just want to die on the side of a green hill, looking at the ocean one day, um, and I just want to live a better life. I don't want to be a part of the problem. You know, I don't want to order from Amazon. I don't, I don't want to be a part of the problem. And so if I can continue to run my business remotely and I can continue to amplify and elevate voices, right. You know, it's just a different stage now. It's just the stakes are a little higher, but it's what I've always done is elevate and amplify voices. So what I'm doing now with podcasting really isn't any different than what I did with one love at all. Yeah. Um, 
And so if I can continue to run my business successfully from down here, that means I can successfully do it from Costa Rica. I love it. I love yes. it. I love you. Yes. You're a fucking goddess. Thank you for making yeah. the world a better place. Thank you for making my world a better place. Um, for yeah, everybody yeah, who's yeah. been watching this, I mean, <laughs> for everyone who's watching this, obviously, uh, do check out um, heartcastmedia.com. Uh, Creator Academy is also um, the new love child of Heartcast Media. Uh, and you can uh, sign up to learn about the classes. Are, are you still looking for people to deliver content? What do you mean? To like to run coaching sessions and to be, be oh, teachers. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, for the yeah. Creator Academy. Totally. So it's, yeah. it's yeah. the creator dot academy. So it's not dot com, it's dot academy. So the creator gotcha. dot academy. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So if you are watching this and you are wanting to get involved uh, or you're just slightly intrigued, go and check it out. <laughs> um, you know, follow Heartcast Media on Instagram, Twitter, and all the things, YouTube, I believe as well. Um, um, yeah. All of that. Facebook, LinkedIn. Fucking boss. Fucking boss, y'all. Uh, this was the second to last uh, podcast for this season. You are okay. at lucky number, I believe, 44. Holy shit. Um, ridiculous <laughs> yeah <laughs> so thank you again molly you're a goddess um right pretending to be a human being and i i just humbly humbly want to throw all of the love all the admiration all of the the good juju your way in north carolina um <laughs> and everyone else please be good be kind spread love like it's going out of fashion be your own kind of superhero and of course do not forget to call your mum you can't control